In Ireland, horses are an indelible part of the landscape, of history and memory, of a past and present where the ancient magic of the horse still weaves its spell. Their presence is pervasive, as if horses help to define what the Irish people are. Horses are the Irishman's sport. Ireland is the birthplace of steeplechasing. Horses are Ireland's tradition. Show jumping originated on this green land. Horses are Ireland's business. This is the Irish national stud. Horses are Ireland's pleasure. Here people still ride across fields and farms to the hounds, and thousands of families keep horses for recreation. This romance of the Irish and their horses was born of the land, nurtured by necessity, and fostered by ancient bonds. It is one of the oldest love stories on earth, the ballad of the Irish horse. Ireland, island of myth and mystery, of wild shores and soft rains, lush pastures and rich soil, where the past still lives. Even today, Ireland remains, as it has been for thousands of years, largely agricultural. Here, the story of man and horse stretches over the centuries, a saga woven of threads of tradition and history, custom and religion, that binds them inseparably in the fiber of Irish life. While the rest of Europe was transformed by the Industrial Revolution, Ireland remained essentially untouched and unchanged. Until only 40 years ago, most families in Ireland needed a horse to plow the fields through the week. On market days, the farmer hitched the horse to a wagon to haul his produce. On Sundays, horse and wagon took the family to church. In remote areas of the West, the old Irish ways and language survive. And the people of Ireland keep horses in their lives and on their landscapes. Here, people still go to fairs at villages and country crossroads to buy and sell horses as they have for centuries. In Napoleonic times, quartermasters from European armies came here to buy the famed Irish horses for their elite cavalry regiments. Today, at the great October fair in Ballinasloe, the flavor of a lost age lingers. What about this one? If she's there for 50 pounds, she's there. Right. The trading is still punctuated by the slapping of hands. A middleman still brings buyer and seller together. And a bit of earth on the horse's hindquarters still shows that a bargain has been struck. Huh? Like his father and grandfather, John Daly is a horse breeder. He came to this fair with his father. Now he brings his son, Alan, knowing the boy will follow in his footsteps. And today he has come to buy Alan a pony. Should we go and see something else anyway? 
mehr interessiert. After a few pounds are given to the seller for luck, Alan leaves the fair with a Connemara pony, a symbol of his future and his heritage. Some 9,000 years ago, man made his way here, crossing a land bridge that once linked Scotland and Ireland. Horses arrived about 2000 BC, brought by Neolithic peoples who introduced their farming culture to this fertile land. The island's placid existence exploded around 500 BC as a wave of Celtic warriors invaded their battle chariots drawn by hot-blooded horses. When the bloody days of plunder and murder subsided, the invaders became settlers, and their Celtic legacy imprinted its indelible stamp on the soul and style of Ireland. The blood of their fiery mounts mixed with that of the indigenous ponies, producing a better, faster horse. Over the centuries, successive tides of conquering peoples and ideas were to sweep across Ireland in her poignant and tumultuous history. There were Vikings, Normans and Englishmen. There were St. Patrick and Christianity. All would create permanent changes on the face of the land and in the hearts of the Irish people. But certain things would never change. For thousands of years and hundreds of generations, man and horse continued to share the soil of Ireland. Today in the West, Connemara ponies still run free over the wild countryside. Here at Loch Mask in County Mayo, John Daly has kept two stallions isolated on an island through the winter. The island is a short trip by boat from the lake shore and Daly's stud farm. Connemara ponies are in fact small horses, muscular and strong-boned. Perfectly adapted to the rugged western landscape, they retain the iron constitutions of wild horses, the ability to forage, the strength to survive on their own in an untamed wilderness. But now in spring, it is time to reunite the gray stallion with the mares. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Here's a boy. Here's a boy. Here's a good fella. With 
the gentleness and expertise attained from a lifetime shared with horses, John quickly gains the stallion's confidence. That's the man. There is evidence that spirited Spanish horses, some imported, some shipwrecked off the coast, mixed with the native ponies to create this hardy breed. Once used as both pack and plow animals in a rough and roadless countryside, today the intelligent, docile Connemara ponies are bred for riding. Daly will release the stallion with the herd allowing him to mate with any of the mares that are in season. Mares come into season only nine days after foaling, but are quick to let a stallion know if his advances are unwelcome. Her posture and stillness indicate this mare's receptiveness. So the blood of native Irish horses, strengthened by the demands of a wild coast, tempered by centuries of work with the Irish people, is passed into the future. And if all goes well, in 11 months there will be a new foal in the daily herd. At Tulara Castle in County Galway, Lady Anne Hempel began breeding Connemara ponies some 25 years ago. An avid rider from the age of three, Lady Hempel wanted her children to share her lifelong enthusiasm. Her husband encouraged her to organize classes in horsemanship for the local children. Two decades later, she is still teaching the County Galway Hunt Branch of Pony Club. Now, if the ponies at grass, what should he have in the field? A uh, water. And... Yes, fine. What's another reason, Davy? Shade is most important, isn't it? Quite right. If Who's supposed to be giving him a wash? Are you looking at his teeth? Yes, if he has a full set of teeth, he's over seven years. Well done, good girl. There are pony club branches all over Ireland, providing an opportunity for both country and city children to learn not only riding, but sportsmanship and proper care of the animals. I think it's a very good foundation for them because it's getting them away from this usual thing of being in the cinemas, the discos, and what have you. Can you manage, Mark? No, you're not able to manage. It's a long way up. I don't know if you'll be able to hold him, will you? Keep away, keep away from that. Go out in the middle of the field so that other people can get through and get mounted. Now, come on. I'll give you a leg. Oh, 
it's a daisy. Well done, good boy. I find it very rewarding, and it's more rewarding that when some of the children that were members of this branch when I first started, they're doctors or they're solicitors or they're business people now, and they are coming back and they've got children. And I call all their children my grandchildren. I haven't got any of my own grandchildren, but I've got plenty of Pony Club grandchildren. Use your legs, kick him on. Now take it easy, just come back again and take it easy. Use your legs, good boy. Don't go so far back. Now, just trot into it. Good boy, well done. Good man, oops! All right? You're fine. Next, shorten up your range. You haven't much contact, have you? You're meant to be trotting. For a small branch, we've produced the winning Pony Club Championship team has gone to England three times, which is quite something. I don't want any racing and I don't want anybody going into hospital. So for goodness sake, just take your ponies down. You can trot down across the field to the river. I'll show you which way to go. I love seeing these children with their happy little faces, but it just gives me the greatest pleasure. So a keen horsewoman passes on the joy of riding the children of yet another generation forge new links with their ancient Irish heritage of horsemanship. Racing horses was the Celts' favorite sport. This plain still bears the name Curra, derived from their ancient word meaning a place where horse racing is held. Keep her going now, the, that next one. Now. Living at the edge of the Curra, the Hutchinson family retains the Celtic passion for horse racing. In the paddock behind their home, Caroline, age 15, is coached by her father, Pat. He was an amateur jockey. She dreams of becoming a professional. Pony races are held throughout Ireland. Though the jockeys are young boys and girls, the betting is serious business, with part of the proceeds going to charity. Six to four. Six to four. Six to four the father had uh, always had about a hundred horses, and he was one of the biggest dealers in the country. He had a couple of thousand acres of land, and I used to ride all our own horses. And now, thank God, the kids are following on. Caroline is one of four Hutchinson daughters participating in this competitive world. One more. Mrs. Hutchinson is active too, but the pony races are a family affair, much like Little League Baseball. Some of Ireland's leading jockeys began their careers in the pony races. Well, Caroline is very good, she's courageous, she has ability, she likes the game and she loves horses. And I don't think she'll ever, no matter what I say or anybody else says, she won't do anything else. She rides to win, and I think that's the secret. I'd love to be a professional jockey when I get older. The biggest challenge for me, anyway, is that I'm a girl. I don't think race riding is wonderful for little girls, but they do like it. They love it. They live for it. They don't want to go to the disco, they want their pony, they want to be a sport. You're always thinking of where you are and thinking ahead of the next bend, whether it's sharp or how to ride the next bend. And especially if you're on a pony that's slow earlier on and comes on fast at the end. Because of her consistent winning, Caroline is sought to race other people's ponies, as well as her father's. When you're in front and when you have one, the owners come running up to you and say, you know, well done and all that. It's just great to see their happy face from winning on their pony. And then your friends would come up and say, well done. It's just a great feeling. I'm delighted that I won the last race. That was a female race. I'm just thrilled that I won it and I had a good pony. Winning against both girls and boys, Caroline raced closer to her dream when she became champion pony racing jockey for an unprecedented fourth consecutive year.
1752, with the steeples as starting and finishing points, a Mr. O'Callaghan raced a Mr. Blake from the church at Buttevant, jumping walls and fences across farms and fields, to the church at Donorail, thus running the first recorded steeplechase. Today, some of Ireland's most popular steeplechases take place at the Galway races. Thousands gather daily to bet on the horses in this week of festivities held at the same time of year that the ancient Celts assembled to honor their god of horse racing. As I rode out through Galway town one day for recreation on the 17th of August, my mind was elevated. There were multitudes assembled from the corners of the nation. My eyes were all a dazzle and I'm going to see the races. It's not the Galway races, you find good company. It's there you see the jockeys and they mounted up so stately. The blue, the pink, the red and green, the emblem of our nation. When the band was wrong for starting, all the horses were impatient. I thought they never stood on ground, their speed was all amazing. It's at the Galway races, you'll find good company. There was half a million people there of all denomination. The Catholic, the Protestant, the Jew, the Presbyterian. Yet the muscle and the muscle tea, no matter what persuasion, but smiles and hospitality, inducing fresh acquaintance. It's at the Galway races, you'll find good company. It's at the Galway races, you'll find good company. The National Stud was established to foster the Irish thoroughbred industry by providing breeders with good stallions at reasonable fees. The record of thoroughbred breeding dates from the publication in 1793 of the first English stud book, which listed three Arab stallions and the royal mares. Every thoroughbred on earth is descended from them. A sire is selected by the breeder on the basis of bloodlines traced back through the stud book, his confirmation or appearance, and the number of races he has won. Six-year-old Rajababa horse. He's a tremendous individual. Great mover, tremendous quality. His first crop on our foals. He won four group races, including the Cork and Ori Stakes at Royal Ascot in course record time. Dr. Moira O'Connor is deputy manager and resident veterinarian at the stud. We're just starting to build her back up again. Yeah. Yeah, they're cutting her down. Yeah, she's walking very well now. Mm -hmm. Ireland is well known as the European nursery. He's come on as well. We have the climate and the soil for rearing horses. And there's a tremendous closeness and a tremendous understanding of the horse in the Irish people. Among her responsibilities is determining when the mares are ready for covering. Every step of the procedure must be carefully monitored in the breeding of these delicate and valuable animals. Come. Eighteen days after the covering, a sonogram is made by a visiting veterinarian and Dr. O'Connor. There's no oil on that, John. With this sophisticated device, they can see inside the mare's uterus and determine if there is a live fetus. You can just see it there, about 10 o'clock. The heart beating, the heart's beating. Within the white spot, the pulsing heart of the tiny fetus is clearly visible. The mare's gestation period is 11 months. The birth usually takes less than an hour. A member of the staff acts as midwife. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. 
I saw the whole walk over. <laughs> For Moira O'Connor and the staff, the hundreds of births they have witnessed in the past do not diminish the wonder of this moment. Well, it should be get off now and do it at home. Oh, Within the hour, the age-old instinct to stand and run with the herd is already stirring in the fold, and the fragile new life is given human help. <laughs> These spindly legs, now trembling and weak, have centuries of speed bred in them. When they are three days old, healthy foals are ready to go outside. Each is examined daily. Those with special problems get special attention. Off you go. There's a baby. There's a baby. That's good. OK. tremendous limestone in Ireland and you get a tremendous amount of minerals coming through the grass to the horses so you get very good bone development and of course race horses need their legs so you want good bone in a race horse. Born to race these foals carry within them the urge to run. Among these new lives there are future champions bred at the Irish national stud to thunder home to yeah. victory on the race tracks of the world. Here at Goffs, the finest thoroughbreds are offered at auction. A yearling, still totally untried as a racehorse, may bring close to a million dollars. Millions are spent as buyers stake their money on the animal's pedigree and confirmation. Vincent O'Brien is the greatest racehorse trainer in the world, a magician who transforms horse flesh into gold. An international group of investors depends on his uncanny eye to select potential champions. His reputation began to soar in the 50s with three consecutive wins at the world's most difficult steeplechase, England's Grand National. There was a stubborn refusal here by Glen Fire. And now for a most unhappy landing. Those were the leaders at the 27th jump, but alas, this fence accounted for the gallant Sanju and Matuvu. No, there was not to be a royal victory this year. At the last fence, Tudor Line jumped wide, but Queer Times made no mistake and galloped away in great style. Neither Tudor Line nor Carey's Cottage, who finished third, could possibly catch him now. It was Queer Times Grand National, all right. And it was the third successive national win for trainer Vincent O'Brien. These Irish. Triumphant of the classic races of steeplechasing, O'Brien next turned his wizardry to flat racing. Son of a farmer, fifth of eight children, he started his remarkable career with a rented stable and three horses. I must have had a natural liking for horses right from the start, and uh, that developed then over the years, and eventually I started training. I don't think I'd be happy doing anything else. Today, his empire spreads over nearly 1,000 acres. Bally Doyle is the world's finest private training facility with magnificent barns, covered rides, 
gallops, each 14 furlongs in length, a 19th century Georgian home, a helicopter pad, and stables of thoroughbreds worth millions of dollars, all under tight security. O'Brien retains a percentage of every horse he trains. Among this season's crop of aristocrats are seven sons of Nijinsky, three of alleged, and nine of Northern Dancer. O'Brien's extraordinary powers seem to spring from an almost magical ability to sense what each animal needs to develop and succeed. It is very important to make a study of each individual animal because they all like people, they all differ. Some horses have got a very easy, calm disposition and they have no mental problems. But others have. They've got to be given special attention and rather specially trained so as to try and keep keep them settled and easy in themselves. O'Brien's success as a trainer is legendary. His race winnings alone have been as high as a million dollars in a single year. But it is after a horse's last race is won that its big money-making career may begin. Today, O'Brien focuses on training colts. After a few major wins of top-class races, the best are retired to stand at stud. Sold to groups of investors for more than $25 million each, these stallions earn huge fees in their years as sires. So the mystique of a man and his thoroughbreds becomes big business, an important component of modern Ireland's economy. In the 18th century, Irish farmers began to breed tough, powerful work animals, able to pull both plow and cart. Today, the blood of the robust Irish draft horse mingles with that of the fiery thoroughbred to produce horses with the stamina needed for jumping and hunting. The hunt, as a gentlemanly pursuit, attained its present form and popularity in 18th century England and was brought here when Ireland was under English rule. Michael Dempsey is master of hounds of the world-famous Galway Blazers Hunt Club. My grandfather was interested in My father was interested in horses, and my uncle, they used to both hunt. At that time, you see, we used to do all the work with horses on the farm. There was no tractors. Once the exclusive province of the aristocracy, Today, the hunt's traditional style is enjoyed by thousands of ardent Irish riding enthusiasts. Dempsey, a local boy, grew up dreaming of becoming master of hounds. But I think I was about either 13 or 14 years, and I said, well, one day, I will hunt those blazer hounds. That was my ambition, yes, from all my life, was to hunt those hounds. A farmer of modest means, Dempsey is paid by the members' subscriptions to hunt the pack. I love those hounds and I know all of them individually and they all have a character and they all are different. And I see them every day to your very close friends. You have to be very close to your own before they'll walk with you. Farmers have long considered foxes to be vermin. Hounds were bred to scent the wild foxes that hid in fields and farms. Hunters riding to hounds followed on horseback, and so this sport evolved. And when you get out there and your pack of hounds going together and you hear their voice, that is the greatest feeling I know. And a good horse under you. And to be able to gallop right across the country behind them and they're really running on and speaking. I think it's the best thrill that anybody could ever get. I don't know what it does to you, that the vice of those hounds, it just gets your blood really up. The first fox of the day is scented and pursued.
often they lose the fox. Sometimes they lose their seat. And occasionally they lose their way. When the last fox outruns the hounds and the hour grows late, Dempsey calls a halt to the day's hunting. Home now. We go for the veal now after this. The hunters head for a traditional last stop, a pub called the Blazers. The Galway Blazers have a reputation for recklessness. It is said that a group of hunters from Galway once reveled so boisterously in a certain hotel that it burst into flames, thus giving the group its name. Tonight, this pub is ablaze with traditional Irish pleasures, the pints, the laughs, and the songs. Every year, the town of Mill Street hosts international show jumping competitions. Show jumping began in Ireland a century ago. Contests to see how high and wide the horses could jump over fences and walls, they offered prizes to those judged most suitable for hunting. This competition is called Carol's Boomerang Finder. It was named in honor of Boomerang, the horse that this man, Eddie Mackin, rode to fame and fortune in the world of international show jumping. The horse that made him a national hero. Mackin's great successes with Boomerang began in the mid-70s Soon, horse and rider were labeled the most exciting partnership show jumping has ever seen. The Hickstead Derby, England, 1977. Winner in 1976. Now, can he beat this time? He'll have to do fantastic turns to do it. And there are few riders more likely to do it than Eddie Mackin. Come on, Boomerang! Come on, Boomerang! Boomerang was everything I am. Uh, I just was very fortunate to meet him at the right stage in life. He was probably fortunate to meet me. We came together and developed a great partnership. And he put me right at the top of world show jumping in a very short period of time. All eyes are on the brilliant Irishman, Eddie Backham. He just pauses. It gives him plenty of time. He's absolutely right for it. Incredible to think that he's now won his fourth British jumping derby in a row. This trophy was commissioned uh, after Boomerang had won his fourth consecutive Hickstead derby. Uh, Hickstead derby is probably one of the most difficult competitions in world show jumping to win. And for a horse to win at once is an achievement, but he actually won it four times. In 1980, Boomerang broke a bone in his foot and Mackin retired him. But Hickstead brought them back for an emotional farewell tribute. It was a sad moment for Eddie as they left the showgrounds for the last time. Three years later, Boomerang's condition became so painful he had to be put down.
he is buried on Mackin's farm. I never have a horse that'll mean as much as Bill Mack. And the possibilities of ever finding one with as much talent are very, very slim indeed. The loss of Boomerang still haunts Mackin's life. With his wife, Suzanne, he searches for a horse with a unique talent and temperament to replace Boomerang. OK. All right. All right. Buying, feeding, training, and caring for a stable of horses is an expensive and time-consuming responsibility. But the Mackin animals get the best, including, for some, a bit of Guinness stout three times a week, on the theory that what Irish doctors prescribe for old people and pregnant women must be good for horses. Youngest of five children, Macken is the son of a small town butcher. You ready to go? Yeah, he's fine. Right home. Yeah, you want to leave him for me in the morning, I'll okay. ride. A superb natural rider, he has grown to be a trainer with a special feel and touch for a horse. This animal seems to have a muscular problem. Mackin examines him to see if a veterinarian is required. They start to get a bit of a thing about this now, all the fiddling. Yeah, the he's just anticipating it. He's very tight there still. Yeah. Well, Robin's coming this afternoon again anyway, isn't he? He is, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Can you now work that other hand on top of his hip to save yourself? Hmm? But there's definitely something catching in there. Yeah. Mm. It's it's a just a really worrying thing for the horse anyway to have somebody contracting his muscles without yeah, his safety. Oh, Eddie himself has acknowledged that a horse like Boomerang comes along only once in a lifetime. But together he and Suzanne continue their quest, hoping to find to create his next great show jumping partner and soften the loss of Boomerang a gallant champion and noble friend. Tell you what it reminds me of. Do you remember that chestnut fall we bought at John V. Dunham? Oh, do you remember? Yeah, yeah it is, actually. That was probably by the Over Ireland, boys who would like to grow up to be the next Eddie Mackin are practicing and competing with the intense hope and fervor of youth. For them, young riders like Philip and Trevor Dagg, success demands more than practice. It requires financial and emotional support from the entire family. As they often do, their parents devote the weekend to the boys' competition. Well, the weather's going to break now, too. How many Maybe more to more go now, Ten more. Ten, Ten more. Ten more until he goes okay. again. Put her in. Philip was once junior champion in pony show jumping. Now he trains his 13-year-old brother, Trevor, who began competing just last year. You come down into it, you're just going down the hill, and the horse just tends to a little bit deeper because you're coming down the hill. So you just want to sit him up so he can, he can compensate for the mm. downhill. You're going too slow and you're half asleep. Now come on, waking up, come on. Philip has already committed himself to a career with horses and coaches other young competitors as well as Trevor. And just give him a little kick, come on. That's good. We'll just go up above and give him a pop and then we'll go in. Now let's have two awake people to jump clear rounds. All right, now, you're gonna win, okay? You're gonna win, okay? You're gonna win, okay? You're gonna win, okay? And we'll trot, trot. Good. And we'll, whoa. Oh, crikey. I'm gonna win today, aren't we? Yes, we are. We're gonna win. Come back and see Philip. Okay? Good lad. Every competition is an opportunity to grow in skill and experience. 
But in Ireland, all competitions are prelude to the most exciting challenge of the year, the Dublin Horse Show. Ireland's greatest horse show, it has been attracting champions for more than a century. All of the riders have qualified to participate by winning at a number of competitions throughout the year. Held at the Royal Dublin Society showgrounds, the Dublin Horse Show has long been considered the nation's premier social event. Enthusiasts from farms, villages and cities across the country join international visitors as 1,000 horses and riders and teams from five nations stage five days of fierce competitions and showmanship. Michael Dempsey is here to demonstrate the obedience of the Galway Blazer Hounds. And Trevor Dagg has an opportunity to compete in the same arena used by the international teams. You'll be all right. Okay, don't worry about it. It'll all go all right when you get out there, okay? Okay, we give him a pop. And this is George Dagg's Bo Bravo. To win the championship, Trevor must clear all the obstacles and jump the course in the shortest time. Oh, no. Whoa. Good man. Well done. Oh, no. It's gone. A caring brother had hoped for first place, but for Trevor, this yellow ribbon may be a harbinger of future successes. It was here that the world's first show jumping competitions were held. This year, Eddie Mackin is one of four riders to set a new Irish jumping record. In this great yearly celebration of horses and horsemanship, the ancient spirit of the Irish people is aroused anew to stir and soar. Within each individual, the warmth of the age-old connection with the animal that has helped shape his nation's history is rekindled. I think we have produced a lot of really world-class horses on the international scene and they've become famous obviously from that but I think the greatest asset the Irish horse has is that as a pleasure horse and for the amateur he seems to be uh, more clever, more easy to deal with, more to handle, to ride and he seems to give a longer period of enjoyment than the continental horses do. Myself and my family, if we have no breakfast Today, tomorrow, some other day in the future, we'll still look after the horse and we give them, we'll give the horse our breakfast. We are with horses for generations and Irish people, while ever they're Irish, they'll talk about horses 
They'll have horses, they'll keep horses. They'll never get rid of them. A tremendous appreciation of the horse runs through the Irish people. Ireland is an island. We are an island people. And as a result, the traits that were in our forefathers are still present today, after many generations. In the quiet of the countryside, a new Connemara pony enters the world. Only minutes old, still weak and wobbly, he is born with the ability to stand alone, to survive in the lean land of the West. Within himself, he carries the strength of thousands of years on Irish soil. The saga of the Irish horse continues in the 20th century because to the people of Ireland, horses represent a link with old ways, old values, a traditional past they want to preserve. So the children of Ireland grow up with these animals, each generation adding new chapters of challenge and hope, triumph and love to the timeless story that is the ballad of the Irish horse. Thank you. 